My name is Leon Pretorius. I've been asked to be the director of the program this morning. And on behalf of the school, the ISD, its sister partners, and the university of which we are a part, and the faculty, we welcome all of you to this program. We would like to welcome in particular our Vice Rector, Prof. Tyron, Vice Chancellor, sorry, uh, Prof. Tyron. Uh, it's uh, always a privilege to have him around. And then we have Mrs. Trader Prickham, who is the editor of this book that we are launching today. And Prof. Uh, ben Turok, it's a privilege to have you. And then our sister organization, the ISD, uh, Prof. Julian May, welcome. Now, we'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the Consul of Mozambique Embassy, Mr. Jemo. We'd like to recognize Mahmoud Khan, the Secretary General of the Mozambican Embassy. And we'd like to recognize the Deputy Consul General of the Dutch Embassy, Nisi Walker Woodot. Please feel welcome. The program is packed. There are activities all around campus. We here represent the, the, the organizations from the EMS faculty. We then also like to recognize our dean from the EMS faculty, Prof. Michel Iso. And then I've also seen uh, some people from the Secretariat. It's not always that we have the people from the Secretariat over here. So you are very welcome. Our students and our director. Look, let, we, let us go into and start the program. The program will open with the opening remarks by Prof. Tyron. Uh, we will. We are celebrating Africa Day. Over to you, Prof. I'd like to apologise in advance uh, if uh, if I'm struggling a bit. Uh, I've uh, had eye surgery this week, and so my focus is a bit out, and the glasses is no longer working. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ben Turok. Ms. Trader Perko, editor of A Feast from Nature. Uh, I understood Prof. Dube was also going to be here. Uh, I'm not sure if she is. Uh, the Dean of the Faculty, Prof. Iso. Uh, Professor Julian May, Director, uh, Center of Excellence in Food Security. Uh, the diplomats, uh, including uh, from Mozambique and uh, as well as the Netherlands. The organizing committee, UWC, Prof. Uh, Isi, and uh, Mr. Umesh Bawa, colleagues, students, and guests. I guess we all know that uh, there is no Africa celebrations at the White House. <laughs> we all know what uh, President Donald Trump thinks of African immigrants to the U.S. <laughs> President, pre President Trump aside, the people of the continent of Africa have plenty to celebrate, but also plenty to think about on this Africa Day. When most people think of Africa and celebration, they think of our rich fabrics, our drum beats, our interesting food. Many in the world forget about ancient advances like the pyramids that lie at the edge of the Sahara Desert, the libraries of Timbuktu, the sophistication of the kingdom of Mapangube, a thriving trading center, a sophisticated trading center around 1200 to 1300 AD. Of course, 
We know in Africa we have a rich history to celebrate. But we mustn't only concentrate on our history. In Afrikaans we have a saying, Medi waters wat verbeie sal die mele nooit weer maal. Which means that uh, the waters that have passed uh, won't make the windmills work again. Here in South Africa it would serve us well to remember our most recent history and that we were the last country on this continent to be liberated. This is important for two reasons. Firstly, that our liberation is not only ours to celebrate. Many countries on the African continent assisted us in our struggle. It is also to remind us as South Africans that we should not look at our brothers and our sisters on the, on the continent in the way that Donald Trump and some Western powers view us. As we celebrate the freedom of our continent and our independence from colonial masters, we must remember that there is much to be valued and much to be appreciated north of, north of South Africa. We are far too quick to look first to Europe and the U.S. for all things future forward. If we need proof of the knowledge and skills in our own backyards, we don't have to look further than the book that we are launching today, A Feast from Nature. What I liked about the book, because I had to scan it quickly, is that Ms. Kutsia uses her own backyard in a manner of speaking to find solutions for one of the biggest threats to humanity, food security. Using a multidisciplinary research approach, Ms. Kutsia investigated the food culture of early humans and later the coin. How remarkable is it that her insights... Can I ask you just to... Yeah. How remarkable is it that her insights gained through long years of research holds potential clues to food security in the 21st century? I regret that Ms. Kutsia is not able to join us today. It would have been wonderful to hear her talk about her journey into food history. That brings me to Prof. Turok's lecture. What an honor it is to have you with us this morning, Prof. Prof. Turok, in so many ways, the ideal person to speak on the topic of deconstructing decolonization because his wealth of experience across this continent of ours is remarkable. He was a chief surveyor and a town planner in Tanzania, a senior lecturer in Zambia, and involvement with the United Nations Economic Commissions for Africa over many years. And then he became a politician. <laughs> As a university with a strong outward focus, we have managed to build relationships with our continental counterparts in significant fields. We always look for room for improvement. As one of the research-led institutions on the continent, it is vital that we as a university create partnerships that offers our students and our academics opportunity to expand their research with continental partners. We must build partnerships that will lead to solutions to 21st challenges, what I call the grand challenges of our time, and food security and climate change are only some of those. I believe we as Africans must address Africa's challenges and disadvantages. To do so, we need armies of ethical people like Prof. Turok and creative researchers like Ms. Kutsia, not armies of soldiers marching across our continent. I thank you. Let me call up Mrs. Trader Prickle. Now, she was the editor, right, of the book. I will, ex I will explain to the people why the author, why the right. author isn't yet. It might be, yeah. Um, 
Thank you very much. I just want to say, thank first the university, uh, Professor Pistorius, and uh, Julian May. I've just enjoyed working with Julian May on this project. To me, it's an honor that we can have the launch at UWC uh, and on Africa Day. It's just a wonderful opportunity because it is so relevant. And I've got a soft spot in my heart for UWC. I've done some work here. With I have another identity. I'm a consultant in the field of innovation. But to me, this book has almost taken over my life. And let me just explain why Renata isn't here. Uh, over a year ago, we were told, we're a group, she lives in Stellenbosch. We were told that she has very few weeks to live. She is such a brave woman that she's still around, but she's not well enough to travel. Uh, and she's not well enough to speak. So how this happened that I'm here, uh, she taught me home ec when I was 14. And we've been, uh, when, uh, we've been friends for the last 40 years. Uh, she's a uh, remarkable woman, and she uh, was kind of has he had health problems for a while. She's 88, um, and when she was 83, she had two operations. The one didn't work. She phoned me from hospital. Trader, as iets verkeerd gaan met die tweede operatie. If something goes wrong with the second operation. You know the book is almost ready. Will you make sure that it comes out? I've spoken to my financial manager. I'm self-funding it. And will you see that the book comes out? You couldn't say no in a situation like that. Well, clearly, she survived that. But then I, was, I had a baby. It was a kind of... <laughs> and, and so I've just been so in love with this book that uh, my good husband there knows how much time and how much joy I've had out of working with the book, finally getting it out. We published it in 2015, and uh, first, and but it, only 500 copies because she was self-funding, and friends, family, and fans bought all of them. And I said, "But this book can't die." And even more, when I heard that, you know, the circumstances, I said, "I've got to find funding um, for this." And so I want to thank uh, the Macintosh family. Um, uh, you may have heard of Farmer Angus at Speer. His family, I went to talk to him. I had, I tried many, many places, but they started me. I had a friend who's a doctor, up, way up in Africa, a German doctor. When he saw the book, he said, this book can't die. Uh, I don't have a lot of money, but can I give you 5,000 euros? Now, 5,000 euros helped a little bit as well. And so friends and family here and there have, have helped. And then... I first spoke to Julian in September, and he said, sorry, we don't have money. And early this year, he said, we will help you a little bit. So it all came together. We found good publishers. I'm very pleased that this, I'm um, enjoying working with the publishers that we have, uh, Africa, Sun, Africa Sun Media, which is, in a way, also fits the book. And so now, uh, that is why Renata isn't here. She knows we're here. She's very excited. I kind of, I put pressure on the publishers and said, I can't wait. Renata must hold the new book in her hand. And I had the privilege on Wednesday to go and show her the new version of the old book. So um, now I'd just like to, I thought the most interesting would be if I page you through the book a little bit. You've seen, there are some pictures up here. And as our vice chancellor said, the history of the book is fascinating. Uh, it's still, um, maybe I will go back with Renata a bit. She, she's been doing food culture research for many years. Um, here is a recent photograph of Renata with a koi man who works at Solms Delta. And Renata taught him to, uh, helped him to establish a garden with um, a, a traditional Food, uh, uh, food plants. So that uh, called Dick Delta, Feinbos Garden. And so you can see, for 88, she doesn't look bad. <laughs> She's in the room. And so, so uh, uh, um, Johan Urain is, has been working with her there. But before that, she wrote a book about the traditional cultural history of the Cape and where all of the different cultures came together. 
uh, 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 and so that was her first book in the 70s. Then she did another book, which I think is the next one we hope to republish. All her books are out of print, and uh, about the food of Africa, um, Funa food, food from Africa. And so again, 10 years of research sitting with old Gorgors in the various areas with interpreters to make sure that the knowledge of the traditional food doesn't go amiss. Um, and, uh, and I was actually had the privilege of editing that book as well. And then, uh, and then she moved to the Cape and then discovered, but no one has ever written about the food of the Khoi. No one has done research. So that was over 15 years of research that she did uh, into the food of the Khoi. And this is a book, Kukumakranka, uh, available in English and in Afrikaans, but both out of, out of, out of, um, well, out of print again. But beautiful work of learning from them. And then as she was working on the Khoi, she discovered that there's a history before the Khoi. And she's always been interested in archaeology and anthropology and things like that. And she then started digging deeper. And this book that we're launching or relaunching today, Funa Food from Africa. Uh, uh, fu, fu, uh, fu, fu, uh, fu, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> a, f a Feast from Nature goes back as far as we can in a work in paleontologists, anthropologists, and so on. And building then, and the theory, which has been pretty well proven, um, in, in current research is that the shift from original from the southern ape to homo sapiens occurred in the western cape because of the context oopsie, is this because of the I've touched something that I shouldn't probably uh, okay I'll, I'll use that one then okay okay and, and so the theory is that that is the shift and that the koi genetically are the closest to the original homo sapiens in terms of their, their genetic profile. And we were privileged there to have Professor Imla Sudial, who's probably South Africa's top geneticist, confirming that and checking every word in that book to make sure that it's right. So let me walk you through the book. I thought... Um, I thought I'd quickly show, is this, am I near enough to this? No. This, I just wanted to show you Renata as a young girl and a younger woman, always a, a leader in her field. I wanted to tell you about the book Funa, Food from Africa, which is an amazing book. Uh, and uh, then she also did a lot of displays of food uh, or kind of entertaining people at embassies, at various other places, uh, showing food. So this is a typical African dis, uh, food, that, uh, the kind of food that came from um, uh, from Funa food from Africa. Then came kukumakranka, and the kukumakranka is a plant uh, that is used in very many different ways in the Khoi community. So that's the source of the name. And now we get to, to our book. As I said... The, if you look at the map, I hope you can see the map. The, it seems that that machine needs replacement. Uh, but um, So if you look at the cave, there are two very famous findings. The one is Blombos Cave near Still Bay, and then Pinnacle Point here at Classes River, where some of the oldest signs of human intelligence have been found. And I just heard this morning from Angus, one of our funders of the book, that uh, at Speer, at uh, Speer Hotel, there's currently an exhibition on the research done at Blombo. So those of you who are curious, I'm certainly going to go around there. So that, th that the first signs, this ochre work of art and, and beads were the first signs. And even in the cave, the people had allocated different parts of the cave for different functions. So that is really what the book is about. So this is a better picture of some of their works of art. And they also started tool making, of course. And then here is the, the food was mainly the fame boss. This is Oinkis uh, in a little, in a bag uh, uh, from hunting. And I will tell you a quick story about Oinkis from Renata. I wish uh, just about 10 days ago, I got a, 
a, a WhatsApp with a short Facebook cut of Renatus telling a story about Oinkies. She said a, a man phoned her and said, could he come and see her? He'd read the book Kukumakranka and there was something he wanted to ask her. And so a young colored man showed up and he said, in Kukumakranka, you talk about Oinkies. Okay, so it, they, the, the, the Oinkies were part of the food, the, the nutrients uh, in the Oinkies and then the seafood. And the seafood was the big thing that made a difference in terms of brand development. So when people started out, they ate, in, ate insects and berries. That was mainly what was, you know, that they could pick. And then they started, and yeah, I, I love this picture of the hunter and the gatherer. Uh, so when they started developing tools, they could start hunting for other things as well. So I don't know if the, unfortunately the pictures aren't as clear as they are in the book, but there he's got a big ochidus. Um And then um, some of you may have seen a lot of the research uh, that came out with um, uh, uh, Mark Berger found the sediba. So sediba was kind of almost regarded as the missing link. That is about two million years ago. So we look at development in the book, looks at development uh, in a kind of not in a great deep, great depth over that time. So that was Sediba, and then this is quite a famous Western Cape case of a footprint, a fossilized footprint was found at Longabon of a young girl going over the sand dunes um, to, uh, to go and fish, fetch seafood. So the theory is that's how people developed, and then having started at the Cape, then people moved out through, through out, uh, all over the world. And then the Koi split off uh, from the other people. Uh, and the, the, uh, at, at that stage, then about, for about 100,000 years ago, and then later on there was again a split between the Southern Koi and the Northern Koi. So the southern koi, in particular, are the ones that are genetically close to the, the first Homo sapiens. So we, then uh, we look into the koi history and their food culture, how they, everything around, how they made music, the tradition, the, and how they cooked. Once they discovered fire, they had different ways of cooking. Um, and then now we get to the plant. So that's the first part of the book. Then we've got a wonderful collection of plants, um, and here's an o again an oinki, a very f famous plant, and this is called okosis, but it's an aloe. Most of us don't think of aloes as being something, but they made a kind of a rice, a koi rice from the aloes. Uh, then berries, uh, I'm sure you've seen some of these berries here, um, uh, num nums, and pods, so different kinds of plants. Uh, and then this is just a variety. I'm just showing you uh, the, the huge variety of many plants that people have, have in their garden but don't realize that they're edible. Um, and this is one that has a huge promise. Um, this is the marama bean. And I know that one of the staff of the, uh, at UWC, uh, Professor Ngidi, is working on, on the marama bean at the moment because it's very high in nutrients and in protein. So they're looking at the potential of this. And we all know these beautiful um, uh, uh, oh, but, um, um, the lilies, and they made the koi, found a way, to, they, they, this, their uh, roots are bitter, but they found a way to remove the bitterness and then make that into a, uh, something from which they could make bread. So they were very innovative in the way they used the plants. Um, and berries, from berries, they also made bread. <coughs> then from the plants, we moved to uh, animals. Here is uh, ostrich and uh, porcupine. And this is what they call um, So I've never eaten it, but I've, evidently the skin of the porcupine is absolutely delicious. So they then started, when they developed tools, they started hunting. And, uh, and, and, then, um, the, and, and then eventually they also become herders. This is, this is one of the last slides, but what I just wanted to show, this was interesting research that Renata had done at the CSIR. She took um, some traditional koi food, 
um, and uh, of the plants, and then uh, including the marama bean and the feldkuhl, and then asked this and looked at the nutritional value, and asked the CSIR to compare that to ordinary the stuff that we buy in our vegetable shops, potatoes, carrots, and things like that. And the research shows that the nutrients value of the koi food is far higher than a lot of the things. And that probably is one of the things that we want to work towards in the future. So here's an example of, come along, the felt well, The felt well is the, um, that's just an example. You probably, as you drive in the streets, you might see it. And I know we had, uh, they're probably growing in the, in, the, in the nature garden here. So I hope people aren't going to harvest there. But uh, so this is just, just in wrapping up, this is again Johan Rayen who worked with Renata, and this is Pinky Viermeyer, who the man at the CSIR who did the research with Renata. They came to at to Solms Delta to this uh, indigenous farm. Then at Solms Delta, Renata trained a chef also with the Koi heritage, uh, Sean Skuman, uh, to make food out of this. And just wrapping up, that is what a plate looks with food that has a strong piece of indigenous heritage. And that's another plate. And I'm going to just leave, the, I'm just going to close it off. There's a, in the poem, in, it's too fine to read, but it, the book ends with a, or a, a poem. I will send that to everyone who's attended here, a copy of that poem. Salam. Africa is looking beautiful today. Renata has given some, um, I'm starting to think of you as Renata. <laughs> Trader has given us an explanation of the genesis of this book. The Center of Excellence in Food Security at, is hosted by the University of Western Cape. It's the only center of excellence to be hosted in South Africa at an historically disadvantaged institution. And we are very proud of this fact. In addition to the Center of Excellence, which has been involved in the, this book, UWC also hosts the UNESCO Chair in African Food Systems. And when Trader approached me about this book, and as she said, my answer was no, but we can help you find the money. And she did. She raised an enormous amount of money to be able to publish this book again, and not only publish it again, publish it at a reasonable price. So it ought to be affordable for many people. We're also negotiating now to see if we can get the book or parts of the book available online so it's available for people for free. Now, that's work in progress. Now, the Centre of Excellence operates through 20 institutions across South Africa. We work in everything from food packaging, uh, plant science. We're looking at poloni. You probably aren't surprised about that. We're looking very carefully at poloni, wearing gloves. Um, we also work through the economics, the political economy of food, as well as to issues around the enjoyment and the pleasure that food gives us. So we've had UWC students in our creative writing programs write poetry about food. They presented it at the McGregor Poetry Festival last year, and this year we've managed to storm the bastions of the Franchuk Literary Fair, um, which I'm delighted about. Um, so we cover everything to do with the humanities right the way through to science. And in thinking about where would this project, where would this book project best fit and I was tempted to go to my colleagues in the humanities who work on food, politics, and culture and say, it belongs with you. But I decided to take it to our colleagues in plant science and in food science, our innovation program, and said, this actually belongs with you. And there's a reason for this. Professor Pretorius mentioned the important innovations, the important contributions that Africa gave to the world. Well, the most fundamentally important contribution that Africa gave to the world was when an African woman stared at a plant and thought, if I pull these weeds up around this, that plant, it will flourish, it will grow better, um, it will thrive, and it will yield the things that I value and I want to eat. That was the first farmer. That's the first person who started thinking, let's not just eat it now, let's protect it, let's nurture it. Professor Pretorius, I always remember, I'm struck by the name what we say in UWC, from hope to action through knowledge. That farmer, that first farmer, used her knowledge 
and who hoped that she would be able to feed her family and, and turn it into action, which meant that humans were able to flourish and thrive. So we made a fundamental contribution. When I listened to Trader sp spoke, it made me think about another very important African language. I've reached you in a few so far, and that is French. And I thought, je suis koi. I'm also koi, because that is where we came from. Um, we're taking this forward. Our colleagues in plant science are going to be looking at the potential of the different plants mentioned. And we've also taken the step to reach out to the Center of Excellence in Indigenous Knowledge Systems at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, because one of the most important things we need to think about is whose intellectual property is it that we are thinking about when we are working with these plants? And how do we ensure that that IP is protected and that acknowledgement is given to that IP? So we are going to link up with that center of excellence to be able to think what happens next as people read the book and become aware of the plants. Enjoy the day. It's going to be fantastic. Um, there's flags everywhere. There's food going to be served later. And I am thoroughly looking forward to Professor Turek's seminar. Okay. We will now get Prof. Greg Reiters, who works with us. He's a senior professor at the School of Government, and he will introduce our guest speaker, lecturer. Over to you. Prof, you, if you choose or elect to sit, you... Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the School of Government and to UWC. Um, today is Africa Day, as we all know. And this morning when I was hunting for a shirt, I found, I found one in my wardrobe, put it on for the Africa day. And my little young daughter said to me, what's going on, Dad? <laughs> what's going on with this? You know, why the shirt? I then said to her, it's Africa day. And, uh, and then she asked, uh, but when do we have Europe day? That's a fantastic <laughs> question. Okay, that's a good one. I said to her that, look, we're still working on that one. Uh, one day, my child, we will consign Europe to a one-day-a-year status. <laughs> and the whole year will be Africa's. So I think that's the kind of aim, is that, 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 that one day we won't have to celebrate one out of our 365 days. It shouldn't be an Africa day. We are in Africa. Why do we have to? So that's part of our challenge, I think. It's really my great great pleasure to invite um, and introduce Professor Ben Turok, who's our key speaker for today. Uh, Professor Turok is a true son of the soil, a passionate and fearless freedom fighter, a grassroots intellectual, not someone who simply um, operates at universities. And in my view, and probably as a lot of people would share this, one of the best economists on the continent, and also one of the best teachers of economics uh, in Africa. Professor Ben was there when the Freedom Charter was being fashioned and debated and written. He was there in Morogoro when the ANC had discussed major issues of its future direction. He was there in 1994 when the RDP was being written and debated, and he is here now. <laughs> and Professor Turok, Ben, as we affectionately know him, has always been at the center of struggles in Africa, particular anti-colonial struggles. He started in his early 20s, even probably sooner than that, as an activist and as a political person. Uh, he founded an institute called the Institute for African Alternatives and worked alongside radical political economists from Senegal, Zimbabwe, Sudan, Nigeria, and Tanzania. He has produced libraries of pamphlets, edited books, his own books, um, and founded journals and magazines. He's been an unrelenting champion of Africa's people and opposed the harsh policies of structural adjustment imposed by Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank. And he's fearlessly spoken out against bad governance in our own country and many other countries. Professor Turok has been a lifelong ANC activist 
and indeed one of its leading thinkers, banned on his banned from South Africa, he returned and lived first in Johannesburg, where I actually got to know him, and later in Cape Town, where he has served as a member of parliament until he retired in 2014. Today he's going to talk to us about a very important issue, and the title of his talk, as you've heard, is Deconstructing Decolonization. What does it actually mean? Yeah, where did it all start? <laughs> I really hope, we're really thankful that he can be with us. It's a very special a privilege for all of us, and I hope that you will be able to um, take a few questions at the end of this talk, if that's appropriate. So please let us extend a warm round of welcome and applause to Professor Venturak. Thank you. I need to see my watch so that I keep time. So I will stay here rather than up at the lectern. And in any case, those things are designed for tall people. I always have a problem. I can't see the audience from there. Uh, I see the vice chancellor has had to leave, but greetings. Uh, dean, uh, staff, ladies, uh, diplomats, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here on Africa Day. And I want to commend you, WC, for making a fuss about Africa Day. South Africa is far too distant from the rest of Africa. I was, like, I was, I was privileged to live in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Zambia. I have been on long visits to Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, Ethiopia, you name it. And so I feel rather sorry for those of you who have been stuck in this little corner of Africa and don't know the continent. I feel very sorry for you. And this is not about op economic opportunities for those who, who study economics, about trade arrangements and so on. It's about the knowledge of the rest of Africa. Really, if you haven't been to Nigeria, you've missed something the most vital, lively people on the continent, and um, I think that South Africa suffers for its isolation. So hopefully today makes up a bit for that distance, and, um, and I want to start with a little story. Uh, in 1966, I escaped from house arrest in Johannesburg, and uh, after some months landed up in Nairobi, um, where the government did not want any South African exiles, and so I then applied to Tanzania, and I was offered a job in Tanzania. My wife and three sons joined me in Nairobi, and we drove down from Nairobi towards Dar es Salaam. And when we got to the border post of Tanzania, there was a barrier and a policeman who said I must fill in a form, an immigration form. Well, I was very happy to do that. I had a letter from the Ministry of Home Affairs of Tanzania, and so I started filling in the form and everything went well until I got to the bottom of the form and it said race. And the choice was European, African, other. So I said to this policeman, uh, I'm a South African refugee, what do you want me to do? He said, no, you're a European, look at your children. All white, you see. So I said, yes, they are white, but they're not European. We have never been to Europe. We're from South Africa. So I can't fill in Europe, European. So he said, well, then I'm not letting you in. So we had a long argument, and my children were rather amused by all this because they were all quite, uh, quite excited about this debate. And uh, we argued and argued, and finally he said, I will not let you in unless you fill in the form. So I said, let's compromise. And other, other I said, I wrote, white African. He said, okay. <laughs> so when my children went to school in Dar es Salaam, they registered as white African. <laughs> At the time, of course, when in South Africa, they would have registered as European. 
And so I felt that I wanted to be decolonized. It may see it sound strange to you. I did not want to say I was European. Something stuck in my throat. And uh, I'd been in the ANC for donkey's years in prison and whatnot. And how could I write down European? And so I stuck with that label, whether you like it or not. And my children are white African. Now, let me turn to the theme of today. I want to talk about three things. Firstly, before we talk about colonization, we need to talk about colonization. What are we de deing? What is colonization? That's the first thing. Secondly, I want to talk about decolonization across Africa. And it seems to me that it's very appropriate that today of all days, we should not only think about us as South Africans wanting to be decolonized, with ample good reason, let me say. I'll have more to say about that later. But we also need to think about decolonization, or as we called it, anti-colonialism in Africa. And then finally, I want to talk about decolonization in South Africa, a major problem. What is colonization? And it seems to me that in the current debates at our universities, something has gone a little bit lopsided. What are we deing? We are deing colonization. What is colonization? And I think there are five criteria for colonization. The first one is political control imposed by a colonial power. That's what they did right across Africa and indeed Latin America and Asia. Political control. That's colonization. I know some of you are students of psychology. Don't forget, political control was an essential ingredient of colonization. Two, that political control was backed by instruments of coercion. The police and the army were extremely important parts of colonization. Let's not forget that either. Three, the objective of colonization was the extraction of material resources. Anyone who's read the history of India, the way the textile industry was ruined in order to extract the raw materials of India, of course in Africa it was about minerals and still is about mineral extraction. Three, four, the justification for all that was racial criteria. We as Europeans as whites, as Europeans, are superior. And so colonialism was justified by racial criteria, a very important dimension of the whole story. And then ideological distortions. We have come, <laughs> I don't want to talk politics, but you know, I can't help referring to Helen Ziller's uh, uh, talk about colonialism. You know, modernization. Oh yes, we modernized Africa. Oh yes, we brought development to Africa, and so on and so on. Colonization, yes, did bring certain advantages, no question. But to say that the essence of colonialism was modernization and development and the bringing of, quote, civilization to Africa is a very serious distortion of the whole history. So that's colonization. Multidimensional Political, military, coercion, ideological, racial characteristics, and false ideologies by the dozen. That's what colonialism is. And when we talk about decolonization, we have to address all those factors and not any one. So what happened in Africa? You know, I'm very fortunate I've been in Africa at the period of decolonization or anti-colonial struggles and uh, I've known some of the leaders of the African continent personally and uh, I'm very conscious of the independence movements. I know some of us who study political science and history tend to pour, to pour cold water on independence movements on just as we say Mandela was a sellout so we say Nkrumah lost his way you know, it's very nice to be able to attack Nyerere, Kaunda, and, 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 and Nkrumah, and to say that they failed, etc., etc. But in the historical context of building independence movements, 
of fighting against colonialism and then striving to decolonize those same countries. You know, not to forget Mugabe with all his sins. You know, those were important figures in our history. And when we talk about decolonizing Africa, all of them wanted to decolonize Africa, even as they were part and parcel of negotiations and transfers of power. And so let us pay tribute to uh, independence movements and, uh, and, and what happened there. Let us also remember that when colonial rule transferred power in India and in Africa, it took a long time. I think it was six years for Nkrumah to come to power. What were they doing, the British, and in India as well? They were building a public service in the image of the British colonial uh, public service. They were building, you know that in, I have met military officers in Tanzania who were trained in Sandhurst in the UK and think of themselves as British army officers, even as Tanzanians speaking Swahili. So the object of the transfer of power was not decolonization. The object of transfer of power was to create an internal force which would continue with the same systems that were ruling under colonialism, namely a local elite, a military compliant, a compliant military grouping, police force and so on, who were sealed and trained in the principles of the British government rather than the African governments. And so there were delays in the transfer of power and therefore the delays in the decolonization that all these leaders wanted. And then they installed the Westminster parliamentary system. Well, I have been a victim of the Western parliamentary system for 20 years in South Africa. When I came to parliament in 19, when was it? Oh, many years ago. And I sat down in my bench and I picked up a, 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 a piece of paper and it said order paper and I said w w what's the agenda for today I'm looking for an agenda they said no no in parliament you don't have agendas this is an order paper you know and you're using the language of the house of commons and even today if you go into our parliament the language is the language of the house of commons not the hang language of South Africa we have not decolonized our parliament Yes, there are black faces, majority, but the culture and the style, the heckling, the heckling that goes on in Parliament today, it's merely copying the House of, House of Commons. That's what they're doing. They think, let's be like the British. That's not decolonization. Indeed, I sometimes feel, and I know some of you are going to be very critical when I say it, I sometimes feel that South Africa is the least decolonized country on the continent. I have lived in Tanzania, I've lived in Zambia and so on, Nigeria, and I feel very free in those countries, even though I happen to have a brown skin like some of you. It's not white, it's not European. My color isn't European, you know. And, uh, but in South Africa, I'm labeled white in the census. What the hell is that? And so I, I repeat, I sometimes feel and I'm a long-standing member of the liberation movement, I sometimes feel that we are the least decolonized on the whole continent. And I'm sure there are students here from the rest of Africa, and you know what I'm talking about. So, after independence, the independence government certainly tried to decolonize. You know, uh, in education, in the, uni in, the, in the field of academics, Nigeria built 21 universities after independence. Tanzania had no university. The first thing that Nyerere did was to build a university. Uh, true, it had a strong law faculty to start with, and, uh, but the first thing he did was to build a university. That's decolonization, to break with European cultures as much as possible. And to, of course, Tanzania, Nyerere insisted on Swahili as the medium of instruction in the schools. My kids went to school in Dar es Salaam and even though they come from Joburg, they had to learn Swahili very fast and they were proficient in no time. That was the culture of Tanzania. That's decolonization. Whereas in South Africa, what are they talking? They're talking English, you know, which is what? It's an indigenous language? Yes, it is, of course. 
<laughs> Nowadays we say French is an African language. Okay, you know, that's not decolonization, but never mind. We, we accept it. <laughs> so they built the... I have to watch the time. I had timed myself rather longer, but I see you giving me 25 minutes. So I'm watching it. Okay. Then we have the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980. Now, there's Professor Adedeji, who was a very powerful economic, uh, professor of economics, who wrote a, a plan called the Lagos Plan of Action in 1980. And it was adopted by the OAU, and it's a policy of self-reliance. It was really directed against structural adjustment, against the IMF and World Bank, and it meant and designed to, to, to encourage Africa to develop its, its own policies, to become self-reliant, not only ideologically, politically, but also economically. Well, the OAU adopted it, and strangely enough, the African Union today still has the Lagos Plan of Action as one of its main documents. Unfortunately, it was never implemented, it was discussed, it was taught at universities, but never implemented by government. And the reason is quite simple. As soon as the Lagos Plan was published, the World Bank produced the Berg Report, a counterattack by a Professor Berg, an American, and that report dealt with policies in exactly the opposite way of self-reliance. It was structural adjustment in terms of fiscal discipline, smaller state, reducing the public service, uh, cost recovery in the public services, you know, in Zimbabwe, some of you may be from Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, Mugabe started off with free education and free health care. And the people in the rural areas flocked to the schools, flocked to the clinics, and Zimbabwe built the foundations of a really good social system. And then came World Bank policies, and Mugabe introduced cost recovery. People had to start paying for services of one kind or another, and the dropout rate, the fall off, was enormous, and the consequences were terrible. And the same thing happened right across Africa. People had to pay for public services, for schooling, for health, for so on, all imposed in terms of, quote, fiscal discipline. These days we talk about fiscal consolidation. It's the same story. Cut back. Cut government, cut government, cut government, so on. And so the Lagos Plan of Action was understood and accepted as being a very se serious and sensible policy. I mean, if you read Nyerere, even now, you can see how concerned he was about self-reliance, about dignity. You know, Usi we kupe jiteke me. Are there any Swahili speakers here? Be self-reliant. Don't be an exploiter in Swahili. And that's what the message that Nyerere was putting forward all the time in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Don't be an exploiter uh, and, and be self-reliant. And he wanted the people, especially in the rural areas, to become self-reliant, to establish cooperatives, communities and so on. Uh, to be self-reliant and not dependent. Uh, you, we all know the idea, <clears throat> don't give me fish, give me a fishing rod. Mm -hmm. You know that slogan. Well, it comes from Nyerere. Don't give me a fish, give me a fishing rod, because Tanzania has a lot of fish. And he said, don't give us charity, give us the means in order to serve ourselves, to be self-reliant. That was decolonization, and that's what Nyerere stood for. So, the, then we get the period of aid. And I want to make a few remarks about ODA and aid. Let's see how my time is. Uh, when I was in Parliament, I somehow got sucked into the whole business of, the, of ODA, of foreign aid. And I was invited to many meetings in Europe and Ghana and various other places to meet with so-called development partners uh, from Europe, you know, uh, IMF, uh, World Bank, OECD, you name it. 
And you go into a meeting, and I remember one in Ghana, quite a big conference, and you go into the conference and people are speaking. And an African will speak and he'll say, we, we are partners in ODA, Partners in Development Aid. And then somebody from Europe will stand up or from America will stand up and say, yes, we are partners and so on and so on. And I sat there and I said, well, wait a minute, you know, you are partners. Uh, partners means equality between two people, uh, except that uh, one person is giving the other money. One is, I said, and I got up at one meeting and I said, hang on, can't we distinguish between donors and recipients? Oh no, we are partners. And so this lie of being partners was extended right across Africa in the name of development aid, pretending that Europe was a partner in the development of Africa, just pretense. And who sets the tone and who sets the tune and who decides the agenda? The donor. So Africa is behest to that kind of foreign intervention and frankly, it will not be totally decolonized until we stop this kind of dependency on foreign goods. And South Africa is in danger of sometimes talking as though foreign aid or foreign investment even is going to be our saviour. It's not true. South Africans are your own saviours. And if you don't know that, well, you don't know anything. <laughs> Mbeki and the African Renaissance. I was part of the NEPAD structures. I was chairman of the African members of parliament uh, for the whole continent. And uh, we had a grouping of MPs from all over Africa, and I was appointed the chair. And we were discussing NEPAD which was also based essentially on self-reliance and developing your own resources. Unfortunately, that has gone. Our government, for whatever reason, and even the ANC, for whatever reason, have abandoned NEPAD and have abandoned African Renaissance. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here with you today and that you respect Africa more than other people do. Now let me turn quickly to decolonization in South Africa. And here is where I'm going to strike controversy and where I hope that you retaliate. <laughs> Our colonial power is internal. We all understand that. The formulation internal colonialism or colonialism of a special type is very appropriate. But what bothers me, frankly, is that after 24 years, the legacy of that internal colonialism is still very strong. We are divided as a society the way that very few societies in Africa are divided. You don't find white colonies in Nigeria or Ghana. You don't. Even in Nairobi, you know, where there was a settler community, you don't find the kind of structures we have in Cape Town, white suburbs. I live in a white group area, I confess. You know, what the hell is that? 24 years after our independence. And so let us recognize and be bold about it that the legacy of internal colonialism is still very strong and affecting our society every day. And the question that's in my mind, as one who believes in non-racialism, as one who believes in the Freedom Charter and one who believes in the Constitution of South Africa, about South Africa belonging to all of us. I hope that that formulation does not cover up the fact that the colonial legacy is still very strong. We can't deny that, even though we are for non-racialism, even though we are against racism, we can't deny the continuation of colonial relationships in our society. Uh, we have universities which are essentially white and universities which are essentially black. You know, I'm not naming names. <laughs> so, um, what remains? And, you know, I think our universities should be open about it and study. 
what is the legacy of internal colonialism in South Africa? Let me be frank about it. And let's fight against it and bring it down. That's decolonization. Now, you see, I told you my story about being a white African. It's true that individuals want to liberate themselves. It's true that I have no identity crisis at all. I know what I am. I know what I've done. I know what I stand for. I apologize for nothing at all. I know who I am. I know my identity. And I'm not going to get involved in debates about my identity. I know who I am. But I understand if some people want to question that about themselves and their role in society. And I understand that. But let us not say that that is more important than understanding the legacy of internal colonialism as a system. Yes. There is a system here. Yes. It's not just race discrimination, it's not just prejudice, it's not just I don't feel comfortable in this community or stuff like that. There is a system in place which is reinforced every day through business, through government, through institutions, through the law, through the justice system. That system has to be challenged. And it seems to me the universities should be the place where you challenge that system properly. And it's the whole of colonial relationships across the board in every sense that has to be taken. And by the way, some of you are anti-capitalist. Of course, I am anti-capitalist. But South Africa is more than capitalist. It's, it's colonial. If you look at ownership patterns, if you look at the structure of the economy, if you look at management systems and so on, my God, it's not just capitalism. Furthermore, some of us are doing studies on the nature of capital in South Africa. The fact that capital is not reinvesting in South Africa, but investing abroad, they're treating this as an island, as a colonial enclave, where you extract wealth. Once you've extracted it, you send your wealth overseas. That's what colonialism is. Why is it that Anglo-American went to go and uh, register uh, uh, overseas. So many of our companies went to go and register in London. Why did they do that? That's colonial. That's colonial. They went mother to mother to go and put their money in a safe place in mother's bank account in London. That's colonialism. And so, com colleagues, I, I want to say to you, we have a hell of a lot to do. We have a big anti-colonial agenda left and decolonization should not be mystified into some obscure psychological distortion. It is a reality of a system that is in place and which is doing a lot of damage every day and all day. So let me end on that and I'm on time, surprisingly. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I was an engineer so I keep a stopwatch. Uh, <laughs> So there we are. Long live. <laughs>